today, Lord God, we thank you for what you are doing. You know that you've already done some things and you are doing and you will do according to your will. So we yield right now to you. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Y'all are awesome. We were talking about how you were shaped. And let's do a little review. The S is for what? Say it again. Spiritual what? Gift. Yes. Yes. We have a spiritual gift. Everybody has a spiritual gift. Amen. The H is for? Heart. Heart or passion. The A is for? Abilities. P is for? Personality. What is the D for? Dreams, desires that lead you into? The direction for which you should be going. So your dreams or your desires actually give you a clue as to which way you're supposed to be going in your life. And I don't think I said that at the very beginning. But your dreams, your desires, some of the things that are in your heart, that's why I'm before you today. It was some of the things that I was dreaming and I was desiring. And I wasn't necessarily won't think I was going to be up in front of people. But I'm an encourager. So I'm doing this now from this platform. And God knew that. And God uh, allowed my mother to know some things about me. The Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. A lot of the times we translate it or interpret it as scripture to mean bring our children to church, and so when they get older, they won't stray from going to church. No, it doesn't mean that. What it means is a parent or parents are supposed to know what's in that child. They're supposed to have a prophetic insight and oversight into their children's lives. They're supposed to know why God gave them those children. And what talents, build, abilities, skills, gifting is inside of that child so the parent can actually groom those children to come up and be who they're supposed to be. What God had in mind when he gave you the child. And so many of us as parents, I know I missed it on, on my children. I told you my, my baby girl told me she wanted to be nice. She said, no, she was picked up on it, but she was really dramatic, very. Um, but, but I didn't help her to follow her dreams, not at three anyway. My husband, though, on the other hand, was a lot more insightful, and he knew some things about all of our children. So we did start, we started late, but we started grooming them in the way that they were supposed to be going. So many parents dream vicariously through their children and live vicariously through their children. They want them to be what they want them to be. Or they want them to be what the parent wanted to be. Yeah. And you should always pray, first of all, say, God, help me to be who I am, who you created me to be. And then if you bless me with children or, or you bless me with people in, in my life, help me to know who that person is so I can help them be all that they are created to be. Because your ultimate design is for God's glory. Yeah. Why you are here on the earth is for God's glory. Yeah. John chapter 17, verse 4. Jesus said, I have fulfilled everything you told me to do on this earth. Now I go back to heaven. Jesus knew before he was born why he would be born. He knew he was coming into a world to redeem the people that were going to be lost. This was before ever creation existed. Because he was there at the beginning. Now, if I had known, like Jesus knew, that when I was born, first of all, I was going to be born a bastard child. My mom and dad had not been together. That the Holy Spirit impregnated my mom. Now, if I was to go around and tell somebody, you know, my mom was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost got her pregnant. People would say, she needs to be committed. <laughs> Put her in the lonely thing because she's crazy. And that's exactly probably what happened during Jesus' time. Mary, who was a teenage girl, she wasn't an adult, you guys. She was a teenager. And it was an embarrassment. It was actually she should have been stoned to death because you're not supposed to be pregnant before you're married during those biblical times. It was an offense that you actually could lose your life for as a woman. Now, that's interesting. They killed a woman. I don't think they ever caught men. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, anyway. Okay, that's what <laughs> But that literally was happening. So if you were going around and saying, you told somebody, my mama is pregnant. And they said, but your mama is a teenager and your mama ain't married. Ooh. But that's what happened. Now God's pregnant. 
And then a uh, husband to be, you know, back in those days, they promised the wife, they promised you to somebody when you was a little kid. You're gonna marry him when y'all get to be a married age. And you ain't got they didn't have anything to do with it. It was arranged marriages during that time. So Joseph knew he was supposed to marry Mary. But then when he found out she was pregnant, he said, oh, 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 I didn't do that. <laughs> I did not do that. So let me, uh, and I'm paraphrasing the script. I'm in the word of God. This is all in the Bible. Yeah. And Joseph said, well, since she's like that, and I know I didn't do it, I'm going to do it because I still love her. I'm going to put her away privately. Nobody will ever know. I'm going to divorce her. How could he divorce somebody that he wasn't even married to? Well, in scriptural times, when you were betrothed or engaged to someone, it was like you were already married to them. Yeah. So he actually was going to go through the process of you know, getting back the diary and all that stuff. That, or get back his money because you know, they had to pay for the wives and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, he said, look, I'm just, I'm going to do this. And the, and the angel of the Lord came to Joseph and said, excuse me. Let me go talk to Mr. Hurtis here because he's the man. You know? <laughs> he said, okay, you Joseph right now, so not Hurtis. Okay, Joseph, look here. God got Mary pregnant through the Holy Spirit, okay? So what I'm going to need you to do is I'm going to need you to go ahead and marry her. Don't have nothing to do with no marital relations. Don't have no sex. Until she had the baby, okay? But you go ahead and do that now. Put them in the divorce papers, tell them up, and I was up. Okay, Joseph, you got that? And Joseph said, okay. Hey, man, it's the angel of the Lord talking to me, so I got to do what the angel of the Lord said, right? And Joseph did just that. He decided to go ahead and marry her after she had the baby. You know, everything just went out. How about that? And then Jesus was born. Your destiny was born. Yeah. The person that came to live and die for your sin, the, the messed up stuff you did, all the cussing, all the lying, all the stealing, all the looking at somebody sideways, you know, all the, uh, all the stuff you did, he's taking it on him. He didn't do nothing but be born. How about that? Now, if I don't know like Jesus, before I was born, that I'm going to have to die for some people that, first of all, will not even acknowledge me as a savior. They're going to look at me sideways and they're going to say, you ain't my savior. I'm still waiting for the Messiah because you was born in a stable. You born in a barn. I need somebody born in the palace. I need you to be born in Buckingham. Yeah. But you weren't born in Buckingham. You were born in Kingsbury. And nobody don't even know who you are. Your mom and your dad wouldn't even marry to each other. Mm -mm, you ain't my savior. I'm looking for the real Messiah. They're still looking too, but Jesus are still looking. And he's already come, died, rolled, and fed. But anyhow, you have an opportunity that Jesus and the people in his day did not have. You have the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of you. If you're born again, you have. God inside of you to tap into his plans and his purposes for your life. And the greater is before you. Some of you have lived extraordinary and wonderful lives, but the best is still yet to come. And that's a word of the Lord for somebody. I'm telling you, Jesus came that you could have this opportunity to listen to this humble servant today and hear that your destiny is not over. No, amen. That you're still destined for what he has made you to be and only you can reach the person that God has for you. Amen. Please don't allow somebody to be waiting on you and you're not in a proper place doing what God has called you to be. First of all, being who you're supposed to be. You got to be before you can do. Most of us are human doings. And we don't know how to be who God has created us to be. When I asked you earlier, could you describe yourself in a sentence or a word? I can't. I'm woman. I'm wife. I'm wound. I'm wonderful. I'm worshipful. I'm witty and I'm wise. Amen. That's who I am. Now, I ain't got nothing to do with what I do. That's who I am. Amen. Whose I am, I belong to God. I'm a child of the Most High King. I'm his servant to do it, his bidding, whatever he asks me to do. That's whose I am. What I do is what I'm doing now. And sing and play and encourage and listen. But who, what I 
do is not who I am. So many of y'all are caught up in your jobs or, or your occupation or your, um, your careers or your uh, businesses. And that's what you do. Some of y'all in the wrong Own business. We're going to talk about that now. After we talk about the fact that Hosea said something about that. I know I haven't given you the E. I'm going to do that right now. E is for your experiences. And that's what we're going to go a little bit into the word of God. Hosea chapter 2 verses uh, 14 through 16, which is part of the text for this wonderful conference, Door of Hope. And in that, I discovered something that I did not know in reading that scripture. It talked about the valley of Achor. So I, I, I just did what, you know, you should do and look up what was the origin of the Valley of Achor. What's in the book of Joshua, actually, Joshua 7. And what happened was God told them, the people at that particular time, he, and he, God did this kind of thing back in the day. They were actually sent out to destroy people, the whole family, not the whole thing. Mama, daddy, sister, brother, children, the donkeys, everything had to die. Everything had to die. Well, one of the guys got to, he, he got his own idea going on. He decided, look, I'm going to kill him. And then he told him not to take nothing from him. Leave everything. They had plenty of riches, but God said, don't take anything. Leave it and come on back. And this was a part of the tribe of Judah. They decided, one guy and his family decided, we can't leave this. We're going to get this and we're going to get this. And we're going to take that and we're going to take this. And we're going to just tuck it away. Nobody going to know. And they went back home. Joshua said, something ain't right. Somebody's done something they weren't supposed to do. And they literally had took the spoil and they found out about it. They said, we're going to give you an opportunity to confess up. Who did it? I need you to be honest right now. So the boy that did it, and y'all can read it in Joshua 7, okay? The boy that did it, he spoke up, yep, I did it. What happened was I saw this gold chain over there and this diamond ring. And I saw this Mercedes Benz and this Bentley, and I just had to have it. I figured God would let me have those little things. I mean, you know, he wouldn't mind. So I just took it. I just, because I needed a Bentley and I needed, a, you know, the diamond ring and I needed the gold chain. Joshua said, you messed up, boy. You messed up. Why? God told you not to do that. So guess what? Go get all your, get your, get your wife, get your children, get your servants, get everything that belongs to you, the whole family, and bring them out here. He did. And they had to kill them all. You said, that's awful, that's cruel, but God was getting rid of all of the sin. In the existence of sin, he was eradicating it so it couldn't spread anymore. God has already done that for you through Jesus Christ. He's gotten rid of all of the sin that you have committed and you will commit. I'm going to say it again. Jesus has done exactly what they did in Joshua. He's gotten rid of all of the sin that you have committed. You're thinking about committing or you will. Jesus already has taken care of that for you should you choose to accept it. Yeah, your sins are forgiven. But you've got to know that. And you've got to say, even when I mess up, even when I let a word slip that I know I don't want to say out of my mouth, Father, forgive me, because it's not in my heart to do that. I don't want to sin. Now, if you want to sin, if you want to keep doing what you're doing, now you, mm -mm. the grace and mercy is not over your life because you want to do it. When we don't want to do something, God knows that, and his grace and his mercy covers us. When you willfully want to lie, when you willfully want to sleep with somebody that ain't your husband or ain't your wife or that you ain't married at all and neither are, you, are they, when you want to go and take a little or, you know, you just want to. Or you want to just tell that lie. I just want to lie on her because I just, I just do. I don't like her. Or you don't like people. That's all sin then you got to deal with what's in your heart. But God said, you know what, and I'm going to call the place where all of this happened, where they took the stuff and we had to kill them. I'm going to call it the Valley of Achor, the Valley of Trouble. But he also said, I'm going to take that same place of trouble and I'm going to bless you. Y'all said, no, he didn't say that. Yes, he did. Let's read it because I don't want y'all to take my word. Hosea. 
the, the, the text that we have. Yeah, chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Stop right there. The place of trouble is also going to be the place of hope. Have you ever looked at your life and the things that have seemingly killed you or taken you out is going to be the place that you're going to be delivered from? You're going to be delivered through the trouble? Remember I said earlier that some of you walked in here with so much on you? You got so, you weighted down, you got troubles. That same trouble is going to help you walk into your place of victory. What the enemy meant to take you out is going to take you up. <laughs> I'm telling you. But it's your perspective of that thing. It's how you're looking at it. Ma'am, keep shaking your head up and down, yes, because you're absolutely right. Because you're looking at it in a different way. You, you have the right perspective. I don't know your name, but I'm talking to you. You know who I'm talking to. You. You have the right perspective. And continue to say yes to all that God is taking you in and through now. The enemy wanted to destroy you. He wanted to take you out because you, your, your life, the light that's in your life has illuminated to so many people. Salvation is going to come through you to so many people. You are a testimony. You have, so, you have the favor of God on your life. You really do. And all... I don't know if you know Pastor Noreen, but I need you to get to Pastor Noreen after this, um, this service so we can t talk more, okay? Some of y'all, uh, I'm telling you, God is going to take your trouble. Thank you, Father. Some of you brothers, God is going to take your trouble. Y'all don't think like us. Ladies, the men don't think like us. Oh, y'all saying, oh, no, we know how they think. If I were to ask y'all, I know what some of y'all going to say. You all were designed by God the way you are. God had a plan in mind when he designed the man first. They were first. Let them be men. Some of y'all need to start upholding the men. You need to encourage these brothers. You need to let them know that they are true men of God and that God loves them and that you love them. And let them be men. They think differently on purpose. God designed them on purpose to think differently than we do. Not better, not worse, but differently. And if we do the thing right, okay, guys, y'all don't hear this part, right? But if we do it right, they'll think they thought it, and they didn't think nothing. You put it there. <laughs> and y'all know that happened all the time. But though, they just smile. Because they're men and they know that's the way it's supposed to be. Some of you are waiting on the right man to come in your life. Some of y'all got the right man and y'all don't think so. Some of y'all got the right man in your life. You got the right one. He rubbed you the wrong way. You look sideways. Sometimes you be wanting to just, uh, it's the right one for you. Okay, that's an aside. That wasn't in my, in my that wasn't in here. Um, okay, put the glasses on and on the paper. God is going to take your trouble, which is what ACAR is, and he's going to make you, it's just going to blow your mind. That's all I can say. It's going to blow your mind. Something happened to me this year that was not planned or intended. I had planned to work on a job just as long as I could work, okay? 
But I had conditions for the job that I was on. I had been on that job three years. And, and where I was living, you actually had to take a test and pass well, about four different tests you had to take to keep the job, so for your certification, rather. So I took out the test, and it was one part of the test. Okay. <laughs> one part of the test that I, I, I didn't pass. Once I didn't pass it, two times I didn't pass it, three times, four times, five times, six times. On the seventh day, in the seventh time, I said, I ain't taking it no more. This is a done deal here. Because what I did, I took it the eighth time, and I didn't pass it. The ninth time, I said, it's over. I must not supposed to be doing this. And I had been on the job for three years, and it was that one test. Now, I have passed other tests like, though, because I have two degrees. And, and I had to pass math in those degree programs, at least one of them. And it was the math test. All of you math people, don't smile now. Don't. Because I will know that you can pass math, and I can't. But it was God's signal to me that your time is up, Linda. See, that was my plan. My plan was to have that job. I went and got that job. I didn't ask the Holy Spirit, is this a job for me? I relocated to a certain part, different part of Florida, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this. God said, oh, okay. And he let me do it for three years. On the third year, he said, I, that is not what I even told you to do because you didn't even ask me. Oh, oh. Okay, what I'm going to be doing then since, you know, well, it's not this. Go back into ministry. And quit working. Oh, quit working? Wait, hold up. <laughs> that would be income that I have, you know. He said, well, I got a plan for you. Didn't you say you want to be out of debt? I did. How am I going to do that without a job, Lord? I mean, you know, it works with you. Get a job, take the money, get from the job, pay the bills. That's how you do it, right? No, that is not his plan for me. He designed it in such a way that I actually retired from the state of Florida because I had enough years to be retired. And then they had a little bit of money for me. And I'm literally saying a little bit. It was not a lot. It's not like, you know, all these thousands of dollars and stuff that I could just live on for the rest of my life because I'm going to live to be 120. <laughs> so I need a lot of money. So, but he gave me his plan. And I am in the process now of his plan because my, one of my dreams was to not be in debt. So I'm actually working on, I paid off my car this year. I paid off another bill before I came over here. And my goal is when I get back, I'm going to pay off a couple of more. Yes, pay them off. Goodbye. That's exciting. And, and I haven't worked since June 14th. He'll do that. He connected me with a financial planner that told me how money works. <laughs> he told me I could make more than two cents off of the two cents I got. That's what God would do. That's his plan. He said, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. But you got to stay in his plan. Now, some of y'all have heard that scripture and heard of that scripture. How many of you have gone to verse 12, which says that you can ask me, you can seek me, and you're going to find me? You can ask me what my plan is for you. I'm going to hear you. Then in verse 13, it said, I'm going to tell you what my plan is. So stop reading 11 and go to 12 and 13 of Jeremiah. Because when you ask for his plan, he'll tell you when you're ready to hear his answer. So I never would have thought my God was going to tell me, uh, retire, move, relocate to another state. No job. Hey, glory. Go back into full-time ministry. Call your friend and say, hey, how you doing? And ain't your conference in July? Oh, yeah, it is in July. Okay, I'm coming. I was just going to come to be in the conference. Then she said, no, we're going to have the women's thing in October. That will be a better time for you to come. I said, okay, I'm just coming. And I was coming to fellowship. I wasn't coming to speak. I was coming to fellowship with her and you guys because I ain't been here in a minute. Well, look what I'm doing. And 
And I didn't come for anything from them. I really didn't. I come to give. God can do the rest. And God blessed me with the little two, two cents to pay for my own ticket. And I brought a friend with me, and she'll give you her testimony. She's a dynamic woman of God. God will set you up. I'll be in, I was supposed to be in Jamaica next month to go to another woman's conference and speak. But they called me and said, no, we'd like to change the date for you to come in March and not be at the women's conference at all. We want you to be in our major conference where all of our churches are coming. God, I'm, I'm, I'm boasting and bragging on God because what God did for me, even in this conference, because I thought it was just going to be women. And he has already proved to me, you are called to the body of Christ, Linda. You have a special anointing for women, but you are called to the body. That's why y'all are here, brothers. So I'm open for the will of God. And wherever he leads me, I'm going. I'm coming back next year. I'm going to bring a bunch of women with me, and I'm bringing my own conference next year. <laughs> yes. Excited about that. I'm excited about what God can do when you allow him to have his plans and purposes. So every experience that you've had in your life is for a season, for a reason, and God wants you to walk out his plans and purposes for your life. God still, and you're not too old. I don't care what your age is, what your stage in life, you're not too young. You're not too married. God going to bless y'all. You all married? God going to bless y'all. You have a good husband. You have a good husband. I don't know him, but you have a good husband. You really do. Hold, his, hold her hand. You have a good relationship. And you need to develop more. do an illustration with this couple of men. It's not going to be embarrassing at all. I just want to show you what God can do. Um, this ain't on the paper either, but I'm following the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be out of y'all way when I'm supposed to be. And then I'm going to get into the last part of this workshop, and then we're going to be done. Stand in front of the people, and actually stand uh, back to back. So there go. <laughs> yes. Now, this is a married couple. That Bible says that they are one, right? Now, the woman, she's very strong. I don't know her, but she's very strong. That's what the Holy Spirit says. She's a strong woman. She got a strong will. <laughs> and sometimes she want to strong arm him, even though he's a little taller. <laughs> but right now, I want you to just humor me and practice this for me, if you will. Lean back on him. No matter how much she leans back, push as hard as you can. Don't let her fall. Push, push, push. Whatever you have to do to keep her up, man, whatever you have to do, whatever you have to do, no matter what you have to do, don't let her fall. Don't let her fall. Hold her up. No matter how strong she is, you got her. Because God created you to be the head, for you to be the strength. Now give her a hug. She said, she said, I can push him down. I can't. He said, not today you won't, not in front of these people you won't. God has a plan for their life. But she's supposed to be dependent on him as he is dependent upon God. You're supposed to love her like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You're supposed to honor him even in the place where he's not. You're supposed to honor him in the place that God is taking him to, not where he is. So your prayer now is, God, where are you taking it? And honor him. Give him the respect from God. And you can do it because God, Holy Spirit, resides on the inside of you. This is for every married woman that's in this house. You are to honor him. And you are to love her. Now, interesting enough, we love as women. 
We love and we want to be loved, right? We have it. It's inside of us to just love and love. But God did not tell her to love him. He said, honor. He didn't tell you to honor or respect her. He told you to love her. So he told the opposite thing. She's loving, but he told, she told her, don't know love, no, respect. He's a man that needs and wants respect and honor, but he didn't say you respect, no, he said love. Opposite. That means you got to know the person that you are with. You got to know how to love her. What makes her happy? Don't do what Earl Brown did to me. Don't give me books. I don't want a book. <laughs> Earl Brown loves books. He loves books. Earl Brown was my husband. He lo was my husband. He loved books. He would give me books every time for, it's for my birthday, for her anniversary, <laughs> just because. He was giving me what he wanted. And I was giving him cologne and shirts and handkerchiefs. And he wanted books and I wanted cologne. We finally got that thing together. He started giving me money, which was much better. Because <laughs> he, lo he knows I love to shop. And I started giving him books. Find out what he needs. Find out what she needs. Y'all going to be so blessed. I'm going to be looking for the testimony when I come back. And that was for every married woman and man in the house. That's the word of the Lord to you. Again, that wasn't on the paper. Seven mountains of influence is where we're going now. And the overhead doesn't work. That's why you can't see these guys, the things that I have. Now we're talking about the seven mountains or the seven spheres of influence. What does that mean? That means a place that, that is... It's an area or range over or within which someone or something acts, exists, or has influence or significance. So basically, it's your domain. It's where you are and what you come from to influence, to, to rule or reign in. Remember, we were created in his image and his likeness, and we were created to have dominion. So this fear, One. It, okay. this fear is, is where you're supposed to be in life, and there are seven of them that exist. Thank you so much. So, again, I said that a sphere is a natural or normal or proper place. It's an area or range over or within some, which someone or something acts, exists, or has influence or significance. A domain, a realm, a field, an area, a territory, a province, arena, or department. Which one are you? Here they are, the seven spheres of influence. Spiritual or religion, or that means the church or your faith. So that's one sphere. Family is another one. Then we have government or law, or politics, you can put it that. But it's not just politics, it's government, because there are all branches of government. There's the arts and entertainment field, sphere, arts and entertainment. There's a business or marketplace. And the last one is media or the news. Now, if you didn't get them all, I'll be happy to go over them again, and I will. Spiritual, it means faith. Pastor uh, Bishop Errol Campbell is anointed for the church or the religious sphere of influence. That's why, part of why he was born. By trade, I know that he's an electrician. But by call and by design from God, he's a pastor from his heart. If you don't know it, some of y'all have been knowing it for years, but I have experienced him as a person. And no matter what country we're in, at a certain time every morning, Bishop Errol Campbell is up. And he is praying out loud. Now, I don't care who house he's in. And he's praying. 
I said, my goodness. And he remembered, though, he was in the States one year. So he went to the back of the house, and he didn't pray quite as loud, but he was praying. His conversation is of the kingdom of God. His mannerism in which he carries himself. His heart is to shepherd the sheep. And now, even as an apostolic mantle is on his life to help other churches be developed. That's who he is. That's what God has placed on his life. I saw it. Noreen is an intercessor from her heart. Yes, she's a midwife, and she has done well in midwifery, so she's supposed to be out there for a season, but that season is over. She is a woman of God. She is the perfect match for Errol Campbell to hold him up. She is an intercessor from her heart. I know. I, I, I've been knowing him now a long, 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 long time. That's the sphere of influence that they're supposed to influence. Yes, he has business skills. She has business skills. But God called them and anointed them for where they are. What is your sphere? Mine is family. And it's to influence family in anything that I do from a religious or a faith realm. My family first. Some people think it's church. No. Mm -mm. I'm called. Yes, I am. But it's family for me. No matter what job I was on, I told them if the phone ring and it's my husband or one of my children or anybody in my family, I will see you later. I didn't care what job, I didn't care what time of day, I didn't care what I was doing. I meant that. And any one of my family members that I came from a huge family, my mom was one of 17 children. And out of them 17, almost every one of them had at least one child. Some of them had lots of children. But I know and keep in touch with almost everyone, at least one person in all of those families. And in some of my extended family, that's just my mom's side. We won't go to my daddy's side too. Because I'm family oriented. I come from every perspective about family. That's my sphere of influence. I know that. Some of you are business people from your heart. You're supposed to be in the marketplace with the gospel. I, I left that part out. See, we as born-again believers, we're supposed to take all of who we are no matter where we are. So if I'm in arts and entertainment, like I know some real born-again Christians, they're, they're actors. That's what they're called to. And they're influ influencing that area for the kingdom. Have you ever looked at your life in that respect? Doctors, I had a wonderful doctor down in Lakeland, Florida. He was a Christian, but he knew he was supposed to be a doctor. He knew he was a businessman, but he was supposed to be influencing the people, his patients, from a biblical perspective. And that's what he did. But he knew he was called to the marketplace to be the light. If you're in the wrong place, if you are a politician sitting up in here, somebody in here. Supposed to be in politics. And I'm speaking to you right now. I don't know how you're supposed to be there, but you're supposed to be in there. You're either supposed to be walking alongside someone or you're supposed to be running for some office yourself. Somebody in here today. And you have, because you're a Christian, don't think you could have ever been any type of influence in that area because you're supposed to be on this job over here. No, that job is going to pay you in the political realm. You are called to politics for the kingdom. Have you ever looked at your life that way? There are so many churches. There's church on this corner, that corner, that corner, that corner. What they get is they get a calling from God. And they think it's the pulpit ministry, so they go start a church. God didn't tell you to start a church. He told you to go and get your office building <laughs> and sell some stuff to somebody and tell them about Jesus, too. You're not called to preach. That's why your church won't. Okay, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm telling you, seriously, if, if these brothers... Someone had really known their hearts and their minds and their passion, those that would play. You would play the drums, I believe, if you could make a living out of it. Would you play the drums full time? Arts and entertainment. And he would do it for the kingdom. But we as a church, nothing against this church now, but most churches are not set up to pay the musicians to live off of. Ask me how I know. 
I played for many churches for free. Didn't ask for nothing. Free. But if I'm called to that, if that's who I'm created to be, I should be able to live from it. And I shouldn't have to go to this church on this Sunday and this church on this Sunday and this church on this Sunday to live. So I can, because if, you know, how many of y'all married up here? All y'all married brothers? Uh-huh. Uh, well, they have to be able to take care of the family. And if they're called to be musicians or singers or whatever, people in the entertainment world do it all the time. Whitney Houston made a lot of money. As a singer in entertainment, she was called to entertainment. Michael Jackson, I'm calling those names because they're no longer here because they didn't fulfill all that God had for them. But some of the people that are in, Tyler Perry is a Christian. He's influencing the entertainment business for the kingdom. He off on some things sometimes too. But that's, he's still operating in his sphere of influence. Have you asked God, why am I here? And what is it I'm supposed to be doing with my life? First of all, that gives you glory and honor. And that'll help me be all that I'm created to be. It's possible that God will answer you. And in a way, like I told you, he take care of me and I just, mm, <laughs> glory to the earth. I never would have thought that it would be happening in the way it is because I've always, they always told me, get up, grow up, go to college, uh, get a good job, and live happily ever after. That ain't God's plan for Linda. Job is not in there. And I don't think it ever was. I just never heard it. <laughs> so which, is, which uh, sphere are you supposed to be in? Let me give you some biblical examples. We're almost done. Let me give you some biblical examples of the seven mountains and seven spheres of influence. People in the Bible. Paul. We know he was an apostle. What else was he? He was a tent maker. He made tents. He did. He made tents. You know, things that they lived in at the time. But he also... Gave himself over for God to use his life in the latter times as an apostle, going around planting churches. So he started off as a tent maker, but he ultimately became all that God had called him to be to change the world. And that's what he did. Peter, James, and John, they were fishermen. And God used their ability to fish and be able to be good fishermen to be fishermen for him to influence the kingdom. They didn't stop fishing when they got saved, y'all. They were still fishermen. And they were listening to God and Jesus on when to fish. Remember, they needed their taxes paid, right? He told them, okay, go over there and catch. No, Lord, we've been up all night long. You won't tell us to fish in the daytime? Fishing at nighttime is the time for the fish because it, okay. God said, I'm telling you, you want your tax money? Go over there and fish right there, and then that fish's mouth is going to be your money. God will tell you some foolish things. Some of you all have heard some foolish stuff. And you said, no. <laughs> People going to look at me. Mm, They're going to be saying, ooh, she crazy. And be crazy for Jesus. Amen. Cornelius, he was in government. Matthew was a tax collector and in government. Luke was a physician. He was in the business realm. Joseph, who was Jesus' earthly father, he was a carpenter. Deborah, yes, I have some women in here, ladies. She was in the government, ruling, honey, yeah, she was a judge. David was in government, and David was in the arts and entertainment field. That boy could play. <laughs> and he wrote so many songs. Solomon, greatest businessman that ever lived. Ruth. She was all about family. Proverbs 31 woman, she was about family and business. I like that girl. <laughs> Moses, he was about religion. God called him to be, you know, to bring his people out. Joseph, who was the son of Jacob, he was in government and family. The woman at the well, she was in media and news. She went and told everything. 
The blind man, same thing. Because they told him not to tell. Don't say nothing. He's, I can't help it. That's who I am. I got to tell these people. Some of y'all got the gift of gab and y'all tell everything. You just meant media news and you need to uh, taper that thing. <laughs> Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Some of you all are hopeless today. And we're going to look at the hopeless media. I wish I could put this up. So imagine that you have the word hopeless on the left hand side. And you have the word hopeful on the right hand side. Then you have an arrow pointing to hopeless and it goes all the way across pointing to hopeful. Got that vision? Where are you on that hope meter is what it is. Hopelessness is a pe people that are operating in fear, which is the opposite of faith, which is hopeful. God said, I have not given you the spirit of or hopelessness, but I've given you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I've given you a measure of faith to walk in. Now, what is Hope, though. We're talking about the door of hope here in this conference today. And in hope, there was a, an actual definition, but I want to read it, too. Hope is to want something to happen or to be true and think that it could happen or be true. It is to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen to be true. An example is you could be hoping for a promotion on your job. Hope is to trust. It's to desire with expectation of obtainment or fulfillment. Example, I hope she remembers. I, hopes, I hope to be invited. To expect with confidence. How many of you came here today? Everybody stand up that can. I wish I had done this at the very beginning. <clears throat> now, how many of you came in hoping that the chair would, would hold you? How many of you thought about whether the chair would hold you? How many of you came in and actually sat down with the expectation that the chair would hold you? Everybody in here. You, first of all, expected the building to be here. You expected somebody to be here to greet you. And you expected that when you came in, you wouldn't have to stand for the whole five or six hours that we would be here. You just sat down in expectation that the chair was going to hold you and you were going to get something of substance today. Amen? How come you won't do God like that for your life? You trust a chair that you don't even know who made the chair. You have, I don't, some of y'all might know who made these chairs. I don't. I just sat down because I knew the chair was going to hold me. I didn't even doubt it. Some of you don't know that God is holding you. Better than a chair could hold you. When you want to, you can sit down. But I, some of y'all need to stay up. Until you really catch a hold on the fact that God has a plan for your life. And it's better than the chair that you're standing by that you know will hold you because you've been sitting in it. And just like you know that that chair would hold you, know that God got your life. And after today, it will not ever be the same. That the thing you wrote down is actually going to happen because you're going to have the substance or the faith to believe that you're going to receive it because it's God's plan. It's his will for your life. God has a plan for your life. You are such a humble servant. You serve so well. In so many different capacities. You've been misplaced though, my sister. You've been doing stuff that is not so much in the sphere that God has for you. And it's because of fear. But today, if you will heed what's in your own heart 
And listen, God said he will give you the desires of your heart. He, what that means is he even gives you what to desire. That's what the scripture means. So what you've been desiring is from God. It's not happenstance that you will be wanting to do what you want to do. God placed that inside of you. And today, if you will have the faith as much as you did to sit down in that chair, to step out on God's plan for your life, you will soar. I promise you that. The same for every one of you that's still standing. And again, you can sit down whenever you get ready. But some of you need to still stand. Stand on the word of God and what God has for you today. I'm not talking about in the today in faith. Faith is I don't see it tangibly. I cannot touch it, but I know it's there. I know that I know that I know it's there. And I'm going to go after the thing. No matter what comes in my life, let's do an illustration now. Put your hand out like this. One finger out like this. Turn it around. Now, look to the walls or look to the floor, look wherever, and get your eyes focused on something, anything. And no matter what your hand does, keep your eye on where you're looking at. Now take that finger and bring it as close to your eye as possible as you can while still looking at whatever you're looking at. What do you see? Do you see your finger or do you see where your eye is focused? You see where your eye focuses because no matter what came, no matter what distraction come to you, you only see what you are looking at where you're supposed to keep your eye and your focus on. Keep your eye on the dream that you wrote down today. And no matter what obstacle is thrown at you, see it coming to pass in your life. And it will. Distractions are supposed to come. The Valley of Echo was a distraction. A few people died, but a whole lot more lived. A whole lot more walked in obedience because they saw that God was real and he meant what he said. He means what he said about your life. I'm telling you, dreams are possible. They are possible. Can I get a little water? <coughs> I drank it already. I need some more. God has a plan for your life. The last thing we're going to do, thank you. The last thing we're going to do, you can have a seat. This is supposed to be a prayer experience. And we're going to pray. And <clears throat> we're going to do it a little differently, though. Because the reason you get what you desire, what you long for, is that you actually believe what you're praying. <laughs> you actually... Y'all heard the phrase, take people at their word? What does that really mean? Say it again. Believe what they say. Um, how many of y'all have really taken God at his word? I mean, you really believe what he says. Really? I mean... No matter what has happened, no matter what you have faced, no matter what um, somebody else said or somebody else did, and I must have supposed to be praying my own prayer because I can't find my paper. So I will. What I did was I looked up a lot of scriptures on the word, there it is over there, on the word um, hope. But right now, before we get to prayer, I want to let you know what prayer is. And as Eve gets the, um, I was going to pass them out, but I'm going to do it a little differently. You're going to each come to me that wants to. You only come if you want to. You don't come because I ask. I'm going to give you what God told me to give you, which is a key. 
And the key represents prayer because prayer is the key. But you got to be praying the right prayer. And you got to pray it in faith, believing that you're going to receive. Just like I'm giving you this key today for you to receive, that's what you do with what you ask God for. When you ask God for it, believe you're going to get it. Otherwise, don't pray. What's the, what, why? And it's only if you want it. At first, I thought I was just going to give it to everybody that came through the door. Nope. Because everybody's not willing to pray God's prayer for their life. So if you want one, come get it one at a time. And uh, when you get it, put your name on it. And then put, uh-oh, don't get that one. <clears throat> you got to put it in your hand. When you get it, oh, Jesus. <laughs> put your name on it. And you can also put on it, wait a minute, hold on. Put your name on it and put the desire. If you can put a bullet point or you can write the whole sentence. Because this is a reminder of for today. Yes, you're welcome. God bless you. You're welcome. And again, this is a faith thing now. This is, this is not a, this is not a um, gimmick. I don't like gimmicks. This is just um, <clears throat> it's a, a symbol, a symbolic. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. We have a lot of keys, I guess. Uh, you get the first. I bless you. I need to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this sister. We thank you right now that she's anointed afresh, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you're giving her encouragement, Lord God, that she will start looking at her life from the inside out, how you've shaped her and molded her. She has so much wisdom inside of her, Lord. Help her to be anointed, Lord God, to share her wisdom, especially with young people, Lord God, for them to glean from all that she's been through in her life, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that she will see herself as you see her, a woman of wisdom, a woman of faith, in Jesus' name. You. Father, we thank you right now that you're healing. You got to believe for your healing. You will walk again. There was a lady that was actually struck by a car and she was paralyzed. And they said she would be paralyzed for life, not ever walk again. She went to healing services and stuff. She didn't get healed. So she decided she didn't ever want to get, you know, another healing service. And this is a true story. <clears throat> she got married. God married her in the wheelchair. She was a worship leader. She worship leader for a church and everything. Her husband is a pastor. So they took a pact together to say, we won't ever take you to healing services because she was tired of people praying over and nothing happened. He was asked to speak in this conference in the city, and she went with him, and it was a healing service. That she didn't know. He got through speaking, and they asked him, is that your wife? And she said, yes. He said, can we pray for her? She went, oh, no, here we go. They prayed for her. Guess what happened? She stood up. She walked for the first time in 20-some years. She's walking today. No wheelchair, no walker, no nothing. This is supposed to be a distraction for you. You've got to witness like never before. You've got to tell people about the goodness, for you, even though it doesn't feel like it's been good for you and to you evangelize like never before. You hear what I'm saying? Tell her the goodness of Jesus. All right, remember to put your name on it 
And then whatever's in your heart. I want to pray for you, too. I don't know you, but can I pray for you? All right. Anybody else? Okay, I know I had to put it in their hand. I'm sorry. We should be here tomorrow? Okay. If not, come to me tomorrow and then we'll I'll pray over it. All right, anybody else? You may. If you would, just put your name on it for me and the dream that you wrote down and or bullet points. That's for you to be reminded of today. And every time you look at it, look at this as being the key, literal key, and prayer that you're going to pray. And you're going to pray over your dream or your desire as if it has already happened, not as if it's going to. You pray that it's already happened. That's how you pray. You get the word of God and you stand on I got a lot of scriptures, but I'm not going to do that today. We're going to pray one scripture. And then I'm going to pair you up with somebody and you're going to pray with that person. That person's going to pray for you because it's supposed to be a prayer luncheon prayer is the key faith though is what unlocks the door you can have the prayer all you want but if you don't believe what you're praying it won't work faith unlocks the door hope is the expectation hope is what creates the door the expectancy that's what hope is so if you hope for something have faith enough to start doing something toward whatever it is. See, I did, in faith, believe that I was going to retire. So I started putting this stuff in place. And two months before I retired, I told the people, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm, this is my last year. And I moved. I moved to Maryland with my daughter. I lived with my daughter. No job. Mm-mm. Faith. I said, I'm going back into full-time ministry. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And God is ordering my steps. God is ordering my steps. And I trust him with my life. I believe God. And my, I got some big, big, much bigger dreams now than I had before I got here. Faith will unlock the door. But the door has to be what you are hoping for. And if it's your trouble, which most of you in here, that's where God is going to start. The thing that has vexed you the most, the people that have gotten on your last nerve, God's going to start right there because that's your valley of Acar. That's your trouble. And you don't want that. I didn't want some of the things that have happened to me. Did not. But I tell you what. All things do work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. They work when you allow them to work. Prayer is the key. And some of y'all can pray. Some of y'all good pray. And most of y'all pray for other people and you believe for other people more than you do yourself. There's somebody in here that you can pray all day and you can pray for people and you believe to see what they want, but you won't do that for yourself. You smiling. And I saw one other person smiling big on this side over here. I ain't going to look at her. It'll work for you too. Lay hands on yourself and say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. 
miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle. Write it down if you want to. Miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle is going to happen. Miracles. Some of the things you're in your wildest dreams. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle is going to happen in your life. Amen. Receive it. Miracle. Just like that lady got out of the, she got up out of the wheelchair that she had been for over 25 years. I saw it. They videotaped it. She was paralyzed from the waist down. She didn't want no more body praying over her. She'd been prayed over and prayed over and prayed over. She married a pastor and he married her in the wheelchair. God delivered her. She walking today. Walking, not hopping, walking. Total miracle. There's going to be some miraculous things to happen in some people's lives. You can write it down. I'm talking about miracles. I'm telling you what I know. Holy Spirit is telling me right now there are going to be some miracles for some of you. Miracles. Some things you never would expect. You asking for down here and it's going to be way out there. Miracles. Your eyes are going to see. Miracles. You can write it down. I told this church uh, back in the 90s, the Lord told me to tell, because every year I came and I would talk to people and talk to people, and there were so many of you wanting to be married. And I said, get hid in Christ, because the Bible says, he that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. So you got to be found. That means you need to be hid. Where should you hide? In Christ. Why? So he can find Christ that's in you. And that'll be the hope of the relationship. And after that, I was told by Pastor Noreen, girl, this girl engaged. Beverly was one of them people. She wasn't married when I first met her. She married wonderfully now. Yeah. <laughs> For years. And there were several other women. That was their desire. They wanted to be married. Some of you wrote down some desires today. And as sure as my name is Linda K. Burst Brown, next year, your desire will have been fulfilled. Amen. Just like I told them then about that, but you got to be in the place that God will have you to be. He created places before he created people. There was chaos all over the place. And he said, I need to bring some order. So he created the earth, heaven and earth, light, dark, separated, sea, all of that stuff. He created the place for him. Why? Because when he put the man where he was supposed to be in the place, then he could do the will of God. Some of y'all out of place. You're in the wrong place. I don't know who you are. You're in the wrong place. And I'm not just talking about church. I'm not talking about a member of a church. Some of you have the wrong job, the wrong career. Some of you live on the wrong street. Some of you are in the wrong church. Some of you, are, it's a place. So ask God what the place is that you're supposed to be. Get in the right place and ask for the right thing. The Bible says that we're supposed to ask according to the will of God. Some of y'all been asking according to your own will what you want, and that, that's your desire. God didn't put that there. That's just what you wanted. There was a lady praying for her husband, praying for her husband, and she was going to the conferences of this particular minister, and she told everybody, that's my husband. That's going to be my husband. Now, here was Kenneth Copeland that was already married to Gloria Copeland. <laughs> this is a true story. Now, did she get to be married to Kenneth Copeland? Because she was asking amiss. She was asking not in the will of God. Now, how far-fetched and funny that sounded to some of you today is some of where you all have been in the prayers that you've been praying because you didn't even ask God what his will was. 
You just asked for what you thought you wanted. All of this is the word of the Lord to you now. It's not Linda talking to me now. I'm talking from Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, some of you all need to be in the right place. Some of you all need to be under the right um, mentorship. Some of you need mentors. You need somebody that's where you want to go. If you are a business person and you a desire business, stand up right now. Stand up if you want to, if you're a business person and know you're a business person. Five, four, three, two. Nobody else stand up, please. All right. The anointing is you can sit for me, sit, sit. Yes, ma'am. Not you can stay. You sit. Stay up. Say a brother. Um God's anointing is on your life, but you need to find a business person to mentor you. If you don't, how many of you have a mentor already? You do. You can sit down. If you don't have a mentor that's doing what you want to do, find one. Start praying today. Young man, three years old, and he wanted to get his mama out of the ghetto. And he had four siblings, and his mama was a single parent. So he was just dreaming, looking out the window one day. He said, I'm looking at my, my, I'm looking at my, my office on Wall Street. I'm, I'm looking at my window in my office on Wall Street. And he was just dreaming. He decided to go put his best suit on, three years old, three, best suit on. He took his mama and sister's old lotion bottles and washed them out and put, mixed up the lotion and put them back in there. He took his lunchbox and put them in that lunchbox. He started going from door to door in the project that he was staying in. It was the ghetto. And he was selling those little bottles. That was his first business venture. Guess how much money he made? One pound. It was a dollar and fifty cents, so our dollar is more powerful than yours. So I just used y'all a pound. He was so excited, he ran to his mom. This is a true story. He ran to his mom. He gave her that money. He said, Mom, we're on our way out of here. At nine years old, he decided, I need mentors. So he went and found mentors to mentor him for where he wanted to go at nine. At 15, he sold his first company for $1.5 million. His name, his name, and he's a real person. This is a true, true story. He got out of the ghetto. He went on to have a Wall Street office, office something. That was in New York. He's got an office out west somewhere. He got several offices. Because he's a multi-millionaire. Started with a dream. And for whatever name is, his name is escaping, but I'm going to know what it is before I leave here today. And I will tell you his name. But he's a real person. He was just dreaming. But he found mentors. That's the word for every business person in here. Well, every person, but especially you people that are in business. Find someone that's doing what you want to do. And they can mentor you directly or they can mentor you from afar. They don't even have to know that they're mentoring you. There are some people that are mentoring me and they don't even know it. You just follow their life. If you're bold enough, you can go ask, but uh, you don't have, they don't have to be in your face. You, especially you. There's something about you. I don't know what it is, but you're going places. You're going to do great things. You really are. And you got to believe that you're going to go to. And you got to let God take you. Really. Business people, go find those people. Because y'all got the money that's going to fund the ministries. Like, people like me. Don't forget me when you get up there. I'll sit down. <laughs> you need a mentor. The rest of you, how many people in here are in family oriented? You, you know you're called to the sphere of family. Stand up. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you that your hand is upon everyone that's for the family. You've seen the turmoil that has been in families. You've seen the devastation, Lord God, that the enemy has launched in family. But I thank you that these women are women of faith and women of God that will stand fast, Lord God, in which you've called them to be strong in family, and they will go forth and let people see what family looks like from your God perspective. I thank you that you've anointed them afresh and that the enemy is bound in their lives and in their families in Jesus' name, and the brothers that are standing as well in Jesus' name. Amen.
How many of you know that you're supposed to be in government or politics? I plead the blood of Jesus over your life right now. I thank you that that is the realm of which the enemy is really raging and bringing about falsehoods and lies. I thank you, Lord God, that they are covered by your blood, Lord God, as they proclaim your word in the area of government. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you are in the, in the sphere of arts and entertainment? You're supposed to be in arts or entertainment. <clears throat> Stand up. And whatever that looks like, you're there for the kingdom's sake. God wants to bless you for it to be full-time should you choose. Should you choose. God's going to make a way that you'll be able to make a living to take care of you, to take care of your families, and to live the life that you're called to live, especially you, Naomi. Yep, you started in one area, and God wants to fulfill that desire. I'm telling you, don't give up anymore, and don't give in. Don't give up, and don't give in. You that are in the arts and entertainment, do not compromise. A lot is going to come at you. You can fit into more than one, but there's one that dominates your life. Like for me, I fit into the church real well, but I know I'm family first. And I approach family from a biblical perspective. I, I approach all of it. I've been in business. I've done business. I've done arts and entertainment. I'm real good at drama. Um, arts and I can sing. I can tell stuff. I have really told a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. Okay. No, I told you to sit down because the time had went for you to stand. I had said, okay, so sorry then. Because when I count down, if I say five, four, three, two, one, and that's it, that was the time that the Holy Spirit had for the person to be anointed for that particular time. So that's why I said that to you. I thought, I thought you understood the counting down. And if I count down and I get to zero, if you hadn't stood up, just stay seated. Because the anointing has gone then. That's what that meant means you all are very important because you will influence an area just like government that is designed by the enemy and this one was the first one arts and entertainment was the first one that because he was a psalmist the boy could sing from his lungs he could play instruments from his lungs lucifer he could play instruments from his lungs he was good he was too good for him own self. So he ended up falling and he took a third of the angels with him. That's how powerful the... Uh, but it was two thirds left. That was more than one third. How about that? This one is important because you're going to change so many people's lives in the industry. People die in there all the time. But it's a hard thing. I've been in, I know people that are in the entertainment business. And it's hard, it's corrupt, very, just like politics, it's corrupt. Business is corrupt. Families corrupt. The church corrupt. But this one, arts and entertainment and government are the ones that are infiltrated by so many because it's a lot of money. And where there's a lot of money, there's a lot of strife. There's a lot of backbiting and, and, oh, my God. So be careful in this moment. Do not compromise who you are in Christ. That's my admonishment to you. Father, I pray over them in Jesus' name. I pray that they're anointed for such a time as this to influence the area of arts and entertainment, Lord, in a way that will bring you glory, that they will see so many lives changed and brought into the kingdom of God because they are where they are supposed to be in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How many of you are in the um, education? You uh, know that you were supposed to be in the education realm. Yeah. Education too, all right. 
All right. Well, Father, we pray right now for the people that are in the education realm. We thank you, Lord God, that they will teach. They will be examples of who you are, that they will do all. They will be administrators, whatever they are supposed to be in that educational realm, Lord God, to help instruct and to help bring about information, Lord God, and transformation as you will have people to be transformed. Anoint them afresh in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. What have I got left? We ha we've had arts and entertainment. We've had um, family. We've had business. We just had education. We've had government. What's left? Media. Who's in media? Who's in media? Anybody in here that's supposed to be going telling something? Stand up, Serge. If I ever knowed anybody that was knowing it, this young man here, I've known Serge, oh my God. And the Lord has blessed him from when I first met him, a very shy young man at that time. But I tell you what, he's anointed. You are anointed, Serge. And I can truly tell you that your best is truly yet to come. It really is. Nikki, I need you to come back here. Yeah, I know them a little bit. I'm going to pray over them, then I'm going to pray over all of you, okay? But I need to pray for these two as you can they, you're part of this team. But I want just them as husband and wife, and then I'll let you come. Oh, hold this hand. Okay, those of you that are in this room, you can stand back up, my sister. Father, I pray right now for the anointing that's on their lives, Lord God, in the area of media. I thank you, Lord God, that you're doing a work as only you can do. I thank you, Lord God, that with the technology and with all that you've anointed them with, that it will be a testament of who you are. Thank you that you'll anoint them afresh to learn even more things about technology and instruments here in the technology field, Lord God, and you will take them farther than they could ever imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Bible says in Ephesians 3 and 20 that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. There's a condition to it, though. It's according to the power that is working on the inside of you. I admonish you today to allow the power of God that's working on the inside of you to work even more so. I'm going to get the one scripture that I want to pray over everybody right now. You in your leisure can look up the word hope, and it will bring up so, so many scriptures. I was amazed at the amount of scripture that came up uh, as it relates to hope. The door in this door of hope is a means of access or participation. It's um, an avenue a passage. It's an approach or an access. I'm telling you, you got, you guys, some of y'all got carte blanche access. The door is created. It is wide open. And I'm not saying walk. I'm telling some of y'all, y'all need to run. You, you are one of those people, ma'am. You need to run. Whichever direction God is taking you, please run. Please don't be afraid anymore. You have really been afraid. Not anymore. God is so with you. He is with you. When I tell you he with you, he with you. Amen. Here's the one scripture I wanted us to pray together. If you would, repeat these words. And it's in Psalm 16 and 9, if you want to look it up when you go home. Psalm 16 and 9. Repeat these words after me. It says, therefore, my heart is glad. And my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. And that's my prayer for you today. Father, I pray today that the people of God will have a heart 
that is glad. They will rejoice with you, Lord, and in your glory. I thank you that their declaration will be that their flesh will come under the submission of Holy Spirit and that they rest in hope. They rest in the expectation, your expectation that you have for them. Thank you, Lord, for the plans that you have for them, plans to prosper them and not to harm them, to give a future and a hope. Thank you, Lord God, that they from this day will now pray to you and ask you what those plans are for their life. And as they ask you, Lord God, they will hear, they will write them down because you said write the vision and make it plain. And as they see it, Lord God, they will declare Claire, from that day forward to walk in your plans and your purposes, that they will trust you, God, with their whole life and believe to see all that you have for them. I pray your anointing upon this ministry, Lord God, and the leaders of this ministry. I pray right now that a fresh anointing is upon their lives in the name of Jesus. For this woman of God, Lord God, I thank you that you have anointed her afresh, Lord, for such a time as this, that you're girding her up on each side. I thank you for the women that you're placing in her life to be on the right and the left side of her, Lord God, even in the back and in the front, Lord God, to gird her up. Thank you as she guards her heart, Lord God. So are you guarding her and the people that you place in her life. I thank you, Lord God, for every resource that's necessary and needed, Lord God. In this season of her life will come. It will overflow in her life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Everybody that has had any adverse thoughts, any adverse thoughts, your Bible says that you're supposed to honor them. Even if you don't agree, you need to honor. And you can do that. You can even honor people that are dishonorable. How? You honor the office for which they are in. God placed Noreen in Bishop Campbell's life years before he was bishop. He is her husband, that's her husband. She's his wife. And as much as lies within you from this day forward, every member of Alpha that's in here, that's who I'm speaking to you. Y'all need to hold her up. You need to pray for her like you've never prayed before. You need to, uh, to love on her in a way that she needs to be loved, not the way you want to love her. She's who God, she's designed the way God designed her. And she's much misunderstood at a lot of times because she's no ring and no ring. She, she really is. But I'm asking you from this day forward to honor the position that she holds as first lady of this ministry, as a woman of God, and then as a woman, period. Some of you women, in here, we're just women, and we need each other. Watch God bless you just because you do that. Well, my time is up, and I want to thank you so much for the opportunity that I've had to be before you. Believe to receive all that God has for you. Watch, pray, seek, hope, and receive all that God has for you. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I would like um, Sister Noreen, if you, you can put your stuff down, but if you can stay here. Sister Noreen to um, just pray over you, please. Praise the Lord. All of us, let us just pray for Linda. I, I just want to thank God for this great woman of God. I thank God that she is not just a woman of God and God's servant, but she's my friend, and she's our friend and a friend of the ministry. And I thank God because I know her intimately in different ways. And, you know, Lord, we just want to thank you because I know that when she stands here, because of knowing so much about her, I know she stands in truth and she stands in holiness and righteousness before God. And, and Father, we just want to thank you because this has been such an awesome day. And we thank you, Lord, that all of us were empowered and we were challenged today, Lord. We were challenged in your word and in everything, Lord. And 
in all our gifts that what we are supposed to be doing, Lord. We pray, God, that as we leave this place, we'll not just leave, Lord, and forget what, Linda, God has used you to impart to us. But, Lord, we will run with the vision. For in the book of Habakkuk, it says, write the vision plain. Put it on table. Though we tarry, it will come to pass. I ask you to bless Linda Brown, Lord. Thank you for her life, her ministry, the call of God on her life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for leading and guiding her. Lord, I thank you for meeting every need that she has physically, spiritually, and financially. For you are not a man that you should lie, neither are you the son of man that you should repent. You have not said and you have not done. You have not spoken, you have not come to pass. And you said, no man has left house or land, mother or father for the gospel's sake, that will not receive a hundredfold in this life and in a life everlasting. And I know, God, that our latter hand is greater than our beginning. And I know, God, that you have a lot in store for her. And, Lord, we know that we'll see the fulfillment of many things in our life. And, Lord, I just ask you to bless her and bless um, uh, Pastor Evelyn as she's come with her. And we just thank you for the love of the brother and the sisters. Thank you for all the women that have come out today, Lord. Thank you for Naomi who led so um, beautifully in moderating and the worship team and the, oh God, thank you for the men, the band, giving up their time to be amongst us, Lord. Thank you for those who come all the way from Croydon, the beacon of hope, Lord. Thank you for all the visitors. Thank you for all the children, Lord. Thank you for the hospitality team. But more than anything, thank you for the Holy Spirit that have been here with us all day. We give you all the praise, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the adoration. And we just want to thank you, Lord. And Lord, may the blessings of the Lord God Almighty go with us. The Father, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, may you rest, remain, and abide with us. Cover each one with the blood of Jesus as they go from this place, Lord. And Lord, we look forward to being together again tomorrow. Bless Linda. And we just thank you for her life in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap. Jesus, we worship you. Now remember, I don't know if I want to tell you that the clock goes back. I don't know. Maybe I should leave it so you come early. So it goes back an hour. So, But we need to be here on time. We do have a little bit extra hours, but we have a lot to do. There is going to be a christening, and so um, I'm not sure how it's going to play out, um, but I believe we should have enough chairs. We want to give God praise. Um, so those of you who wants to come for the final day of the conference, um, Evelyn will be speaking, and I just can't wait to hear this woman of God. I'm looking forward to see what the Lord is going to use her to do, and we are excited. Um, Friday night was so awesome. My God, remember, remember Pastor Matilda, so awesome about Rahab and how she expounded the word. I gave her a text this morning. I said, I thank God for using you so mightily in expounding the word and bringing the revelation out of that word. And I said, what a good first night. God has blessed you. And she just put up prayer and say thanks. And uh, we're going to be seeing her next week. Sunday, we're going down to their church. They're having a celebration. So um, when I go, I will just give her all the greetings. And we want to just thank God and bless you. Do you want to say something? Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen. So um, you're dismissed, and we're just going to clear up. Unfortunately, we have to put this stuff behind the... Um, the curtains, apparently. Is that so, Meverly? Because we were supposed to have the all, but um, they've double booked. Somebody else is coming in. Yeah? So we just put them behind. Yeah. Is that be all right? But, you know, one of my pride, I don't know if I should tell you on my list, is that um, we're going to have a church fully paid up. Yeah. And um, that is one of my prayer. So, you know, that is on my key. And I'm believing God. 
Amen. We won't have none of this um, endurance because that's what it is. God bless you.